Our first speaker, um, whom I love, uh, is Dr. Paul Sandell, and he is the Reed and, and Carol Walker, Carol Lee Walker Professor of Pediatrics, Human Oncology and Genetics, and the Director of Research for the Division of Pediatric Chemonc and the BMT at the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, he has focused on basic translational and clinical cancer immunotherapy since 1969. Um, he has numerous, you know, positions, you know, within, uh, you know, ANR, within COG, um, and his laboratory has pursued strategies for enabling uh, immune responses to impact on cancer. Some have moved into clinical testing in adults at the University of Wisconsin and in children throughout the COG. This includes collaborative development of an FDA-approved immunotherapy regimen, uh, dinatoximab, um, and for children with neuroblastoma. Um, he has held multiple committee leadership roles within neuroblastoma. Uh, he's been at the NCI, American Cancer Society, COG, St. Jude's. He's, he's been all over. Uh, he has been a scholar of the Leukemia Society of America and recently received a seven-year Outstanding Investigator Award from the NCI. He has published more than 390 scientific articles and chapters and trained more than 70 graduate students and postdocs. Um, he enjoys biking, uh, canoeing, and most of all being with his family and sharing you know, the love with his family. This is Dr. Paul Sundell. Thanks very much, Pat, for that very kind introduction, and thanks to you and the CNCF for all of it does. Uh, thanks to you for being here. Uh, I began working as a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin in the realm of childhood cancer treatment and research. And at that point in 1980, had the privilege of working with families like you, families that joined a club that was very supportive and very helpful to one another, but a club nobody would have ever wanted to sign up for. And members of that club, from the very beginning when I started doing this kind of work in 1980, showed me how much they were willing to do whatever it took for their child, no matter what it was. Tell me what we could do, and we'd want to do it. And your being here is part of that. So uh, it uh, helps teach those of us working in the field what love and commitment's really about. What I'd like to talk about today is progress in cancer treatment, where we've come, with a specific focus on neuroblastoma. And because this is the first talk of the day, and it's gonna be a really terrific day with many, many uh, helpful talks, and because immunotherapy has gotten a lot more attention because of some recent real progress that's come out of the laboratory in helping children, as well as adults, I thought I would give in part an overview of immunology, immunotherapy, and how it works. Uh, and uh, then focus on neuroblastoma. So uh, the slide here is just where I work at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. This is a typical disclosure slide. Uh, while uh, the University of Wisconsin holds some patents that relate to work that I've done, and I volunteer as an unpaid advisor for a biotech company in Madison, I have no financial connections to any drug or biotech company, uh, and uh, wanted you to know that. I was born in 1950. Uh, the year before that, there was a little hope anywhere in the world for children with cancer. In 1949, an investigator at uh, the Harvard Medical School, uh, an investigator named Sidney Farber, uh, this was uh, roughly 20 years or so, or no, 23 years, before Dr. Nai Kong Chung and I began our first day in medical school there together in 1972. Uh, he said there's gotta be something better that you can do to help children with cancer. We can't accept that there's nothing that we can provide other than pain relief. And he, <coughs> based on laboratory work, started taking drugs that could at least kill cancer in the test tube and asked could he start using them in a controlled way to see if they could make a difference for children with cancer. And he started working on leukemia. And, and this story is really the story of chemotherapy development. And chemotherapy 
can really make a difference for children and adults with cancer. Chemotherapy, though, are poisons. But by giving those poisons at the right dose, at the right time, in the right combination, the field of cancer research, and particularly childhood cancer research, went from virtually no cures for childhood leukemia, for the most common kind, to now over 80% being standard. When we look at all childhood cancers overall, we went from a period of virtually no cures at all to a period where we're now approaching 80% cures for children with cancer. But as you know, 80% cure still means that 20% are not being cured, and even for those that are being cured, at what cost? So here's the survival curve. The way that we got there was because of research. And the research team involved in getting us there included laboratory investigators, clinical investigators, and you, the parents and the patients, who said, I want what's absolutely best for my child. But if I can learn that, and in the process, help provide some answers that might help children next year or next decade, let's try and do both. That's the idea behind clinical research. And without that kind of clinical research, we would still be at a 0% kind of cure rate. So despite this progress, which is very, very real, the treatments we're using can be very difficult, are associated with both short-term and long-term side effects, and still they're not working for everybody. We've got to do better, and the answer is through research. So why is it that in 2018, not all children or all adults with all of this progress are being cured? With the treatments that are now considered conventional and standard, namely surgery and radiation therapy and chemotherapy, Almost all children with cancer, and virtually almost all adults with cancer, can be put into remission, a state where when you look hard to find the cancer, you can't see it by doing an x-ray or a clinical exam. The trouble is that doesn't mean the cancer is gone. It means that the cancer that you can see is gone. But a child, when they're diagnosed with cancer, has roughly a million times a million. That's a trillion cancer cells. If you get rid of 99.99999% of those, you're still left with a million cancer cells. And having just one cancer cell that can still go on living is enough for that cancer to come back. So in order to really cure an individual with cancer, we gotta get rid of all of the cancer cells. So there are a number of approaches that are trying to take us there. These are newer approaches using drugs that are more targeted against the cancer, trying to find the cancer's Achilles heel in a way that gets at the cancer, but not the normal cells. And one of those approaches is immunotherapy. Now, all of you have had some familiarity with biology and the immune system. You're familiar with vaccinations to protect us from polio or influenza. Uh, you're familiar with your immune system that protects you from viral infections. I know many of you have been coming to these meetings for several years, but I know that some of you are here for the first time, and I don't want to assume how much background anybody has, so I apologize if I'm going over things that are very familiar for some of you. But the immune system that helps protect us from infection can sometimes do very potent things. Sometimes the immune system, if it gets out of control, can cause autoimmune diseases like lupus or multiple sclerosis, when the immune system's turned on to recognize something we don't want it to recognize or somebody who needs a kidney transplant because their kidney isn't working. If we don't turn off their immune system, that kidney will be rejected. So the idea of immunotherapy is can we take that same immune response that's strong enough to reject a kidney and instead direct it against the cancer and see if we can get rid of all of the cancer. So back in the 50s, it was possible to do this in mice in a variety of ways. This is one of the first experiments that was done uh, that in essence showed uh, that if you take a mouse that has a cancer growing in it, and I'll show some scientific slides in the talk today. Uh, if the, this cancer is growing and it kills the mouse, it means that the mouse's own immune system isn't strong enough to recognize that cancer. But if you do surgery on that mouse and remove the cancer, and you remove the cancer before it started to spread in different places, you could cure that mouse of that cancer. And then if you give that same mouse some of the same cancer that would have killed it before, now the mouse can reject the cancer. And it's because of an immune response, and it's particularly because of the cells of the immune response 
cells you'll hear more about, cells called T cells or natural killer cells. So this was a form of a cancer immune response that could be done in mice. So now, 65 years later, these are the components of the immune system that are being used effectively to treat cancer here in the United States and around the world. This part, this circle at the bottom, is circling around this particular cell, a T cell. A T cell is the cell that in your body has the capability of recognizing viruses and getting rid of the cells that are infected with viruses and protecting you from viruses. In many cancer immunotherapy approaches, these are the cells that are potent at being turned on to kill the tumor, particularly with some of the more potent therapies helping adults with cancer. This is something we call adaptive recognition. But many childhood cancers are hard to get these kinds of T cells to respond to. So the immunotherapy approaches that have been making the largest impact on childhood cancer are approaches that involve something we call synthetic recognition, where we create something in the laboratory that can recognize the cancer and see it being different than normal cells. That something is called a monoclonal antibody, like dinatuximab, a molecule that most of you have heard of. So you can take an antibody like dinatuximab that binds to the tumor, and certain cells of the immune system then stick to the antibody and can kill the tumor because they see the antibody on the tumor. Alternatively, you can take this antibody and take the blueprint for the antibody, the genes for it, and inject it into a T cell. This is called a CAR T cell. And that T cell now has a way of recognizing cancer cells. This approach is being used to treat neuroblastoma. It's still very experimental, but it's been used very effectively to treat leukemia. Part of what we're working on is to see if we can take this kind of synthetic recognition starting with an antibody and help turn it into this adaptive recognition that turns on this powerhouse immune response, T cells that can recognize the cancer. And that's what I'll take some time to get to. So here are the facts for neuroblastoma as we understood them back uh, not quite a decade ago. Roughly half the children with neuroblastoma are diagnosed with so-called low risk or intermediate risk. But even what's called intermediate risk is associated with some children not being cured of the neuroblastoma. And for families that thought that their child might have had the flu or had a, something that twisted their knee before they were diagnosed, and then to learn that they've got a disease that is potentially non-curable, even if the more majority are cured, it absolutely turns your lives upside down. And sadly, about half of the children with neuroblastoma are diagnosed with this high-risk disease for which the outcome results were not very good uh, 10 years ago, and they still need to be improved dramatically. So I had the great fortune to be able to interact with Ralph Reisfeld, uh, an investigator, PhD, who made one of these antibodies at the uh, research institute he worked at in San Diego. Uh, we began working with him, and in our laboratory, my colleague Jackie Hank took his antibody that recognized neuroblastoma and she added it to neuroblastoma cells in the test tube and added to it some of the white blood cells from healthy people, natural killer cells they're called, and that mixture was able to kill the neuroblastoma as long as the antibody was there and as long as a white blood cell activator was there, an activator called interleukin-2. We saw good killing. But if we took blood from patients with cancer, the cancer itself suppresses the immune system. And when we did this same test, we weren't seeing very much killing of the neuroblastoma. But if we took those patients with cancer, these happened to be adults that had a separate kind of cancer, kidney cancer, that came to our institution. And we treated them with that white blood cell activator, interleukin-2, and then did the test. We showed that their white blood cells now could kill the tumor very well as long as the antibody was on the neuroblastoma and the IL-2 was there. Based on that, we did studies in test tubes, in mice, went to the COG, and looked and got all the information we could to try and come up with a plan that made sense to us. In addition to doing what we had done with the interleukin-2 and Ralph Reisfeld's laboratory, we paid very close attention to pioneering work done by Nai Kong Chung using a separate antibody called 3F8 that he had made that also recognizes neuroblastoma. He had been using it in combination with a separate white blood cell activator called GMCSF. It activates other cells to stick to the antibody and kill neuroblastoma. 
Alice Yu was pioneering also the use of that GMCSF together with the dinatuximab. Wasn't called that at the time. So we came up with an approach based on the mouse research and the test tube research to give this combination of the monoclonal antibody together with GMCSF and IL-2. And we decided to give it to children when they were in remission after all their chemotherapy and radiation therapy and surgery. Because we knew even though they were in remission, most of those children still had small amounts of neuroblastoma left behind. And we had shown in our mouse work that this kind of approach was best at getting rid of small amounts of neuroblastoma, not big amounts of neuroblastoma. So the results of that study showed that for those children that were in remission, if we added the immunotherapy, the immunotherapy clearly helped. That's the blue line. This is showing children that are doing well without the neuroblastoma coming back. The red line are those children that were in remission that didn't get the immunotherapy. So when we learned of this and published it in 2010, the Children's Oncology Group and many other places said what we used to call the standard therapy is no longer standard. Now it's outmoded therapy. The immunotherapy is the standard therapy. Let's start doing that for everybody. It took 20 years between the initial report of how this worked in the test tube to proving that it was making a difference and publishing it in the New England Journal of Medicine and five more years before the Food and Drug Administration finally approved this as being available. So research moves slowly. If only research could move faster. This meeting, ANR, is trying to help it move faster, but it still is a painfully slow process. So, I mean, that's the good news. The bad news is that even for those children in remission that get the immunotherapy, roughly 40% of them are still having the neuroblastoma coming back. That's not good enough. In addition, in order to get this immunotherapy and have the chance of it working, you need to go into remission in order to get this immunotherapy, at least by this regimen. And we know that only about 70% of newly diagnosed children with high-risk neuroblastoma will go into remission. So we need to do something for those children who still have neuroblastoma you can see, bulky neuroblastoma that's not going into remission. What I'd like to focus on now are these nine separate things. These are the clinical and preclinical initiatives that you'll hear about today. And uh, these are ways to use this anti-GD2 antibody or similar approaches to try and have an impact. First, uh, you'll hear about these in blue from other presenters. You'll hear about how anti-GD2 antibody can be given by a different schedule and how it can be potentially tolerated better without as many side effects. You'll hear from Dr. Federico how the antibody can be combined with chemotherapy and how that's showing very promising results and that's being tested. I mentioned earlier how anti-GD2 antibody is being used to develop CAR T cells. And I don't think there's a specific talk about that here today, but it's an approach that's also being pursued. You'll hear how about anti-GD2 is being incorporated into a novel haploidentical bone marrow transplant regimen from Dr. Handgrettinger in Germany. You'll hear from Dr. Chung of Sloan Kettering how a vaccine directed against GD2 looks like it's helping for people that are in remission. I'll focus on these items in red and talk about work that our team or COG is doing. And this first one, we're involved with, but also the NANT is involved with. And so let's go to that, uh, how uh, anti-GD2 might be working together with natural killer cells. So this is an anti-GD2 antibody. It's a cartoon of the antibody. This end binds to the tumor. This end binds to the white blood cells. I showed you before how the antibody works better, it seems, if we combine it with IL-2. This, this molecule made by our collaborator, Steve Gillies, actually attached the IL-2 to the antibody. So it puts the IL-2 right where the antibody is. It has certain advantages, at least when you treat mice with this approach. If you use no treatment at all, these mice all have neuroblastoma. Each of these bars shows the number of metast metastases in the mouse. If you use the antibody and IL-2, you do much better. But if you use the antibody attached to IL-2, it seems to make a big difference. We showed that this approach works best in remission, in mice with small amounts of cancer. The more cancer, the less well it works. We've done clinical trials of this through the Children's Oncology Group, a study published by Susie Schusterman et al. in 2010, and a separate study that confirmed this, showing that this approach does have real activity against patients with relapsed neuroblastoma. 
So I won't take more time to talk about that. But I'll talk about this molecule because it's got both the antibody and the IL-2 components to it. And since natural killer cells are driven by IL-2, there are two separate clinical protocols that are either open or soon to open that take white blood cells from either a patient or in our case at the University of Wisconsin from a donor that's been selected for their cure genes, for genes that help their natural killer cells work better with a particular patient. We take their uh, blood donation, we grow their white blood cells in a culture system for roughly two weeks to get their natural killer cells to expand a hundredfold and become far more activated. We then give these back to the patient together with that antibody linked to IL-2. This is a study that's being led by my colleague, Dr. Ken DeSantis, and a very similar protocol will be presented by Dr. Marachilian later, where this same concept is being used, but using the patient's own natural killer cells. I'd now like to switch to how we might be able to combine uh, other approaches together with an anti-GD2 antibody. And I'd like to move from the clinical testing into some mouse work. So I focused on how this antibody alone kind of approach seems to work in remission. What can we do to use immunotherapy to act on tumor that's big enough to see or measure? So Eric Johnson in our laboratory took a tumor that had GD2 on it. So this antibody recognizes it. It happens to be a tumor that's a melanoma. Uh, he put this into mice and let it grow so it was barely big enough to see and feel. At that point, if we were to give this antibody approach, or even this antibody linked to IL-2, which we call immunocytokine, it's abbreviated IC. The tumors still grow. They grow more slowly, but they grow. That's not good enough. If we give the same molecule directly into the tumor, injected, we can show that we get 100 times more antibody molecules stuck to the tumor. And that allows us to have these tumors not grow, and in many cases, they go away. Based on that, Richard Yang in our laboratory did that same mouse experiment for mice with a very small neuroblastoma. He had a neuroblastoma that was big enough for you to see and feel, even though it was small. He injected it directly into the tumor with this antibody IL-2 combination, and in that setting, he was able to cure over half of the mice. Now we asked, what was allowing those mice to be cured? So he took the same mice that were being cured and he depleted their T cells. So he got rid of the T cells that are the important part of the adaptive immune response. And those mice weren't cured. He also said, what happens if we get rid of the natural killer cells? And those mice weren't cured. So this experiment proves that you need both the natural killer cells and the T cells working together collaboratively in order to get this cure. But these tumors were tiny. So the next thing we did is work with a radiation therapy resident who joined our laboratory uh, named Zach Morris. He took that same GD2 positive melanoma and he let it grow in these mice for five full weeks, which is a long time for a mouse tumor. These tumors were pretty big for a mouse. At the time that they were that big, he then gave these mice a low dose of radiation therapy, 12 gray. It's a dose that's about a third to a fourth, the kind of dose that would be used to treat neuroblastoma clinically. Then, six days later, he injected the tumor with the immunotherapy, putting the antibody linked IL-2 directly into the tumor, and then asked what happened. And we were very pleased with the results. Let me explain this graph. This graph on this part of the curve, this pointer's running out of power a little bit. So this is uh, uh, how big the tumor is, and this is time. So the gold line shows how the tumor is growing if you don't treat it with anything. The green line shows that the radiation therapy slows it down a little bit, but it's still growing. The black line shows how the immunotherapy slows it down a little bit, but it's still growing. But the purple line, now for the first time, takes these big tumors and shows that they're shrinking away and going away, and all the animals are alive at 60 days, and nearly three-fourths of the animals continue to go on living for months and months, without the neuroblast, without this melanoma ever coming back. So these animals were cured by this approach. Now they're mice, they're not patients. We need to do this first before we can try and show what we can make happen in patients. In studies that we've published, and I, I won't take time to go through all the science here, we showed that if we cured the mice from that tumor, and we take the cured mice 
and then expose them to the same tumor again, it won't grow. They reject it. But if we expose them to a separate tumor, it will grow, a tumor that's not related to that initial tumor. So this proves that the radiation together with the local immunotherapy turned that tumor that was already in the mouse into a vaccine that vaccinated the mouse against that tumor to protect the mouse from the cancer. Well, that's well and good, but cancer in patients doesn't behave that way. It's rare that cancer is only in a single spot and you can get rid of that cancer by just thinking about that single spot. Radiation therapists have known for a long time that rare patients with some cancers can get radiation to one spot. That spot can shrink and then without any other therapy, very rare patients will show other spots shrinking. We believe strongly that that's an immune response that was turned on by the initial radiation therapy. And in certain adult cancers, it looks like we can do more of that by using a separate kind of treatment called checkpoint blockade for some adults. But that treatment isn't working so far for children with cancer. We need to do something more. So the question is, can we try and do an immune response that makes a tumor that's in the mouse function like a vaccine and then have that tumor go away and have an effect at a distant tumor site? So what Zach Moore set up in this setting was uh, he put one tumor into the mouse, he let it grow for five weeks. At the time that he was going to be irradiating that tumor, he put a separate tumor on the other side. So each of these mice had two tumors, the one that was big enough for us to irradiate and inject, and then the smaller tumor that we hid by putting the shield in front of the radiation therapy so it didn't get any radiation therapy. We thought we knew what was going to happen. We thought that we would radiate this tumor, inject it with the immunotherapy, get it to shrink, turn on the immune vaccine response and get rid of the distant second tumor. And it didn't work that way. And that's why we've got to do the experiment. Here's the scary result of this experiment. If we do the radiation and the injection of a mouse with a single tumor, that tumor goes away. If we do the radiation and injection of that same tumor in a mouse that has a distant second tumor, the tumor that we irradiated and the tumor that we injected does not go away. It continues to grow. It says that the distant cancer is having an immunologic effect on the cancer that we can see and treat. It says that we need to be worried about this because the cancer is causing something that's immunosuppressive that's blocking our immunologic efforts. We need to understand this and figure out a way to overcome it. In order to understand it, we showed that if we make the distant tumor not a melanoma, but a pancreatic cancer, now the melanoma is able to go away. So it means if the tumor you're trying to get rid of is a melanoma, and the distant tumor is a melanoma, like what happened in, in a cancer patient, you block the immune response. But if the distant tumor is something else, it doesn't cause this immune inhibition, something we call tolerance. So is there anything we can do to overcome this? Well, if we do the same exact thing in mice, irradiate the big tumor, inject the big tumor, but also irradiate the small tumor. By irradiating both of them, now the big tumor goes away. So it means whatever is causing this suppression is sensitive to radiation. We know that certain T cells are sensitive to radiation. And as much as we have T cells that kill viruses and do immune things to protect us, we need to have T cells in our body that know how to turn off an immune response so that we don't get MS or rheumatoid arthritis each time we have a viral infection. And those T cells that do that are called T regulatory cells. So we did a lot of science and I won't go through it, but we ended up proving that the reason that that small separate tumor was blocking our immune response is that it had T regulatory cells in it, cells that were specifically able to block our anti-tumor immune response and that we could overcome them by treating them with radiation therapy. The problem is, if we've got those kinds of cancers spread in a variety of places in a patient, how can you get radiation therapy to all of those? I'll get to that in a little bit. But is there anything else we could do to have an impact on that? Well, I mentioned checkpoint blockade before. By itself, it's not working very well in children with cancer, but it's working okay in certain adult diseases. One of the ways that checkpoint blockade works is by getting rid of T regulatory cells. So here we did the same experiment. 
We took the mouse with two cancers. We irradiated the big cancer. We injected the big cancer. The big cancer continues to grow. But if we now add checkpoint blockade, now the big cancer shrinks. But the important clinical question is what's happening at the other tumor? The tumor that you didn't irradiate, that you didn't inject. It too is going away. As long as you injected the big tumor and irradiated the big tumor and gave the checkpoint blockade. So this is something we'd like to move forward with clinically. We're gonna go forward with that in the setting of melanoma. This is work with neuroblastoma, not melanoma. Complex experiments, because of time, I'm not gonna go through all of it, but what, what we're showing here in this graph is that, in fact, if we take mice with two separate neuroblastomas, we don't get the response at the big neuroblastoma like we do if there was only one neuroblastoma in there. So in other words, we're seeing this same kind of inhibition in the setting of neuroblastoma that we've studied at length in the setting of melanoma. And we're seeing this with two different kinds of neuroblastoma, one that it's easier to get an immune response to, and the other, we're just doing early experiments, it's harder to get an immune response because there aren't as many mutations in this neuroblastoma. It's a neuroblastoma that's driven by NMYC, a molecule you may have heard of that's important in high-risk neuroblastoma. So we think that, that this particular neuroblastoma, that Julie Voller, who's our second-year fellow, who's here with me today, uh, is doing laboratory work on in mice to see what we can do to get rid of that neuroblastoma with this kind of approach. So I mentioned, how do you try and get at tumor sites that are distant if you want to irradiate all of them? In theory, you could give total body irradiation to a patient, but the trouble is that would be counterproductive because the total body irradiation will suppress your immune response. <coughs> but all of you have heard of MIBG, a molecule that is selectively taken up by neuroblastoma allows you to selectively deliver radiation to neuroblastoma. So we're working with that. We're also working with a next generation kind of radiation therapy. It's called NM600. It's selectively taken up not only by neuroblastoma, but by virtually any kind of cancer. And our colleagues have put a different kind of radiation isotope on it, a radiation isotope that's easier to give and doesn't require staying in a lead-lined room for a long period of time. And in essence, this graph shows that we can use that kind of targeted radiation therapy together with immunotherapy and get rid of a neuroblastoma in this setting, in mice. So, where are we going with this? We've talked about how important these suppressor cells are. I've shown you how we can have a controlling effect on them by either irradiating them or using certain kinds of checkpoint blockade. If we do that and combine it with an antibody IL-2 kind of approach, we can turn on these natural killer cells get some of these tumor cells to die, have those dying tumor cells now have tumor fragments that are still stuck to the antibody that are picked up by other cells that can pick up dying tumor cells, process them, and present them to your T cells to turn on a T cell response that then is driven by IL-2 to be able to come back and destroy the cancer where you're injecting it or at distant sites. This radiation therapy component I mentioned, we can't give total body radiation, but we could give targeted molecular radiation therapy, like I said, where we use this NM600 kind of approach, or MIBG. So we're now moving this into clinical testing. Some of you may have heard of a trial called the MINIVAN trial. This is a trial that's going to be, as far as we know, the first transatlantic clinical trial of neuroblastoma. Uh, this trial is being led by Juliet Gray of Southampton with sites in London, as well as Griesewald, Germany, led by Holger Lode, as well as our site in Madison, Wisconsin, that I'm working on with my colleague Ken DeSantis. It's called the MINIVAN trial because of the ME for MIBG, the NEV for nivolumab, the checkpoint blockade, and the AN for the antibody, the dinatuximab beta. So uh, the whole idea is to be using the antibody to stick to the tumor for the reasons that I've told you about already so far today, to be combining it with the radiation therapy that's targeted to get around this immunosuppressive effect and enhance the immunotherapy, and to use checkpoint blockade that Holger Lode has shown specifically works together with dinatuximab beta. Here's the schedule. Uh, patients will get the uh, MIBG. 
uh, in two separate uh, doses and then get uh, every couple of weeks nivolumab as well as every six week cycles of the dinatuximab beta. Lastly, we're taking the concept I showed you about irradiating a tumor, injecting the tumor directly with the immunotherapy, and combining that with checkpoint blockade. And we're going to test this first in adults with melanoma, uh, because this has never been done in humans before. We're going to do that in our center in Madison. Once we've got some safety data from that, the Pediatric Cancer Immunotherapy Trials Network that has 10 separate institutions throughout North America is talking about opening up this same trial for children with GD2 positive tumors that would be both neuroblastoma and other GD2 positive malignancies like osteosarcoma, the Ewing sarcoma. Now, the work that I've shown you has all been focused on anti-GD2 antibody. But there are many other antibodies out there for which you could do similar sorts of things. I'll just give one example. B7H3 is a molecule that's very overexpressed on neuroblastoma. It's not expressed on very many normal tissues. Dr. Chung and his team at Sloan Kettering have used an antibody they've created against this molecule to have a huge impact on a variety of settings in neuroblastoma, particularly having an impact on uh, CNS disease uh, when neuroblastoma is spread there. This molecule is on neuroblastoma, and a company uh, called Macrogenics has created an antibody that binds well to that neuroblastoma and allows natural killer cells to kill cells that are coated with this antibody. Uh, we are doing a trial of this uh, through the Pediatric Cancer Dream Team that's supported by Stand Up to Cancer in St. Baldrick's. This trial is currently open, and it's open at the Pediatric Cancer Dream Team sites. There are eight of them, uh, and uh, it's led uh, by my colleague, uh, Ken DeSantis. So this is just one example of what can be done with a monoclonal antibody, but I've shown you some of the work we've done in mice that uh, provides other ways that we could be using an antibody <coughs> to try and have a better effect by combining it with other immunotherapies or with other more standard therapies. And as much as we've talked mostly about GD2 antibody and mentioned B7H3, there are many, many other antibodies that are approved for cancer or in clinical trials or in laboratory development. I think it's fair to say within the next five to maybe 10 years, no matter what kind of cancer any individual, be the, they a child or an adult, have, yeah, there should be a monoclonal antibody that's able to recognize their cancer and could be used in combination with other approaches to try and have a better effect. So based on the progress in cancer immunotherapy, uh, four, five years ago, the journal Science chose immunotherapy as the breakthrough of the year of all kinds of science in the world based on the kind of clinical translation and benefit that's being seen, including what we're seeing in neuroblastoma. We, we know that we can take this progress and do much better. What's our goal? Our, our goal for childhood cancer treatment is more effective, less toxic treatment for all children with cancer. We'd like to be incorporating immunotherapy widely. We think that it can be in addition to, or in some cases, a substitution or replacement for chemotherapy. We'd like to change the meaning of cancer. No matter how good we get at it, when any family in the future learns their child has cancer, it's going to make them take a breath and say, oh my God. But I'd like you all to think back to 100 years ago this year. In 1918, there was a terrible epidemic of influenza associated with pneumonia. It's estimated that 20 to 50 million people worldwide died of influenza-associated pneumonia in, 2000, in, in 1918. When someone learned their relative had pneumonia in 1918, they said, oh my god. Now in 2018, when we learn someone has pneumonia, we say, that's too bad. It's not great. We can take care of this. We'd like to change the diagnosis of cancer to that. We'd like us to be able to say, together, we can take care of that. So thanks so much for being here. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Oh.
I forgot to thank all the people that are working on this. These are the people in our lab. The lab pictures at the top, our pediatric oncology programs below it, many people in our cancer center, many people collaborating with us through COG, the Pediatric Cancer Dream Team, St. Jude, uh, industrial collaborators, uh, and others. These are the uh, many uh, funding sources that enable us to do this work. And, and finally, the thanks most importantly go to our patients. These are children uh, who've been treated at our cancer center. Virtually all cancer treatment centers have similar kinds of reunions. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, these children and their families are part of a club they didn't sign up to join, but there is clearly a link with them. Uh, these children have been cured by the laboratory research that moved forward in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Clearly, the work in immunotherapy and targeted therapy going on now is going to cure many more with many fewer side effects. So I'll leave it there. Thank, thank you, Dr. Sandel. Um, do we have questions? We'll take a few questions. Thank you. That was awesome. I love your passion. It's so touching. Um, so I'm a mother of a nine-year uh, survivor, and she had uh, 14, 18 with IL-2, um, and uh, she's treated at chalk and um, CHLI. So my question is, and maybe you answered it with all the science. I it just lost it. <laughs> Is there any evidence that the kids that got 14, 18, like around 2009, 10, um, that that vaccine, that that is acting like a vaccine to contribute to even longer survival rates? It's a very important question, and I want to be really open and honest. We'd love to have that data, and we don't have it yet. Are you working to collect it? We, we are working to try and collect that. And I think that part of the nature of your question is trying to ask, might there still be neuroblastoma in your child? And if so, could it still relapse? Now, you didn't share, how, how, how is your child doing? She's doing great. She, um, she was stage four, high risk, had a tumor, diagnosed at age five, um, metastasized everywhere, uh, cleared early. Didn't have to do any MIBG therapy. Um, did Accutane, did IL-2, did radiation, surgery, the whole deal. So the vaccine effect we think is important and helpful, but not necessary in certain circumstances. The vaccine effect is to turn on that T cell side of the immune response, the way vaccines work. If we treat mice with a small amount of cancer, really <coughs> tiny, we can cure those mice even without T cells, even without a vaccine, just by using the antibody IL-2 natural killer cell approach. That's really the rationale behind the current regimen of dinatuximab IL-2 uh, GMCSF. That's why we're treating those children in remission. So it's possible that we might be turning on a vaccine effect in some of them, but we think that many of those children may be getting cured without even needing the vaccine effect. But for those children who get that regimen and aren't being cured, or for those children who can't get that regimen because they're not going into remission or even close, we need to come up with something stronger. And there we'd like to be able to turn on a vaccine. Mm -hmm. So that's where some of the mouse work we're working on is, is moving. And the, mm -hmm. the clinical trials that I showed towards the end, where we're going to be using the radiation and the intratumoral injection and the checkpoint blockade, there we're going to do our best to try and look for a vaccine effect. So it's kind of early then to tell if um, kids like mine who are, you know, early uh, 14, 18 IL-2 receivers, that may be preventing the neuroblastoma from coming back. We don't know. Um, that, yes. And again, in the mouse model, we can show that. And the explanation for it is when you're getting the treatment itself, the presence of the antibody and the presence of the GMCSF in the IL-2 might be strong enough that it's getting rid of all of the neuroblastoma, that there's none left. And, and if you get down to zero neuroblastoma cells, then the neuroblastoma shouldn't come back. Okay, then same kind of question, but regarding MIBG. For the kids that get MIBG therapy, any sense that that's acting as a long-term vaccine? Uh, at this point, we don't think that the MIBG is going to be working that way as a long-term vaccine. We think combining that kind of radiation therapy with additional therapies may help us, and at least in our mouse model, it looks like we might be seeing that. 
Uh, the children's oncology group is going to be asking the importance of MIBG early on in treatment by taking children with high-risk neuroblastoma that are diagnosed, get their chemotherapy, and getting ready for their autologous bone marrow transplant approach, which is part of the COG regimen. Not, not everywhere is doing that, but it's part of the COG approach. And those children, some will get MIBG and some won't. And it's only by doing that kind of a randomized trial will we get the answer whether the MIBG is actually helping keep some of those children from having the neuroblastoma come back. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Do we have one there? And yeah, can you um, just state your name, where you're from, you know, just so we have. Sure. Good morning. My name recording. is Conan Viernes, Seattle, Washington. Uh, my question is I know that. Uh, after frontline treatment, there's a couple options for parents. One is a vaccine that's at Sloan. Is there any discussion within COG to create a, a vaccine trial? I think that it's important that each separate uh, trial group pursues the approaches that they've been studying in the lab and trying to move forward. So the vaccine approach at Sloan looks really interesting and we're really glad that it's being done and once more data are out it may be appropriate for other places to be using that approach but for now we're eager to see how the results from Sloan are, are coming out and Nikong's going to talk about that next. Uh, COG is pursuing other options and you'll hear about them in the talks uh, later today but the the one that we're particularly excited about is the combination of anti-GD2 antibody together with chemotherapy. And it may be in that setting that the chemotherapy might be doing some of what the radiation is doing that we've showed in the mouse model when you time it right. Maybe the right kind of chemotherapy together with the antibody is allowing the cancer that's in place to be functioning as a vaccine. Any other questions? That's it? Okay, thank Thanks. you, Dr. Sandel.